Uh, it has come to my attention that there was an interview, a Famitsu interview with Yoshida, Ishikawa, and Oda-san on the development of Inwalker's story. This is the Famitsu interview that was posted this week, in this week's issue. And I haven't read any of this yet, so I'm really curious about it. Uh, it's a translation of the main points of the interview. So they were asked, this is between uh, Yoshida, Ishikawa, and Oda-san. When did you decide to bring the story so far to a conclusion? So after Shadowbringers released, around the end of 2019, Image Studio, which is the CGI studio within Square Enix that makes the high quality cinematics in various Square Enix games, had to be provided with storyboards. So at the end of 2019, in autumn and winter of that year, we went on a residential together in order to decide the main points of the story for the next expansion. But the problem was, so I think what that means, went on a residential, I think what that means is, uh, because in the past I had heard that whenever they are working on this story for an expansion, they all go to a hotel together, like all the writers go to a hotel, and uh, they like just lock themselves in there and work on it together and brainstorm constantly uh, for like a week or something, maybe longer. But the problem was we're used to the writing process and so feeling that here and here are the remaining parts of the story we have to talk about, so let's accept the rest. The residential went very smoothly. What? <laughs> Why does it sound like it went so easy? Like it's easy for you to do, for you to write in Walker? I was in charge of filling in the details of the story elements, but when I looked at the structure of the content again, I thought this might be okay for just another expansion. But if this is labeled the finale, is it really okay? So I reworked the story from the plot outline. The end result was ready two days before the deadline. <laughs> Holy shit. Ishikawa finished two days before the deadline and it was barely, it was not even a challenge. It was barely an inconvenience. They breezed through the whole writing process and it went extremely smoothly. It wasn't even hard. It wasn't even hard. She's so powerful. I'm shocked. I thought I was going to hear, oh man, we were all struggling. We just couldn't figure out how to make all the pieces go together. And it was like 3D chat. No, it was nothing. She barely broke a sweat. So anyway, in the plot at that point were elements such as Meteon already included. She said the name Meteon wasn't there yet, but the base form of what she became had been decided. Yoshipi said during the residential, the core parts of the story were listed. But after that, Ishikawa said, we didn't reach agreement, so I rewrote it. She took matters into her own hands. As a result, when we compared the story decided on at the residential and the rewrite Ishikawa presented, we thought it was the right choice to rework this. Holy shit. She just completely took matters into her own hands and decided what was gonna be best. She took control. Yoshida goes on to explain that around the time of Stormblood, the team didn't really think about how the story would continue long term. We could tell. <laughs> we could tell in Stormblood. When making Shadowbringers, it was said that about 80% of the plot points had been revealed, and he thought after Shadowbringers it might be possible to keep things going from one to two more expansions. Looking at the fan response immediately after Shadowbringers, he felt that there should be one more expansion. If the story had been two expansions and continued up to 7.0, what was the planned structure? So Ishikawa said, we expected there, there would be an expansion about Garlemald. Oh, thank God they didn't do that. The idea was that Anima would be the boss. Then the next expansion, you'd fight against Hydaelyn, Zodiac, and so on. I'm glad we didn't have a whole Garlemald expansion. That would have sucked so much. Can you imagine? She's been Stormblood too, yeah. Oda explains that the devs seek to balance on delivering on players' expectations and also having unexpected developments. Players were already expecting to fight Hydaelyn and Zodiac. True. So it was debated whether to deliver the fight straightforwardly 
or have a surprise development where one of them would take over the other and fight you. In the end, the team decided to go for the straightforward route. I honestly didn't think it was that straightforward because pretty much everybody that I know was shocked that we were fighting Zodiac so it, that felt so soon and so early into the main story quest. And it really, I think it helped make the story feel even more epic because everybody had the same reaction. We're like, wait, we're, this is the Zodiac battle right now. We're not ready for this. And he's not even fully uh, created. Like he's not even fully formed. And it's just, I thought that was an interesting twist that it's not, it didn't go the normal video game route of like, let's wait for him to be fully rejoined. And then we're going to have, the, no, it was just like, no, here we go. Like we're doing it right now. And then the other thing that really did put a twist in this too with Heidelin. Everybody knew that we were going to be fighting Heidelin. Everybody expected it. And with me, I knew going into the Heidelin fight, this is it. Like, she is going to be gone after this. And I felt like I had prepared myself for that emotionally. But there's just no way to prepare yourself for that cutscene. Like, even knowing that that's what will come, it's just, oh my god. That was devastating. That was devastating to witness. So when was it decided the final act was going to include go, uh, include going to space? Ishikawa said, when I was thinking about the story, one of the earliest key phrases I decided on was Alpha knows line when the Ragnarok sets off, go further than the moon beyond the heavens. To the moon! <laughs> the details were decided on in 2020, but I was thinking of the main points of the final act in late 2019. So that's why it was so easy for her when they finally got to the residential because she'd been thinking about that since late 2019, like already just constantly brainstorming and thinking about it. It was just, it wasn't something that she was just like, oh, it's time for us to go to the residential now and we're going to work on the story. It's something that is always in her heart and in her mind and it really shows Oda said previously there'd been elements like Omega and the dragons that linked to space. So we talked about that. We should make use of these. Ishikawa said, Oda-san is very into sci-fi. Oh, is he a Trekkie? So I thought maybe he can put some nice details into a location like Ultima Thule. Oh man, that was so cool. We can safely make it to the edge of the universe. Ishikawa says, when she joined the team during Realm Reborn's development, Hyland's call, hear, feel, think, already existed. When she first looked at it, she thought it was interesting that it was like this, with think at the end, rather than see, hear, feel. When she wrote Endwalker, she decided to bring back this line that players not only see and hear, but also think about what they've experienced up until now. That was such a cool moment in the in the Highland fight when like you hear it in context finally. Hear the song of creation zen. Feel the sorrow of hope's demise. Think. Find your way through the darkness. Hmm. I think about that line a lot. Uh, <laughs> this, this is probably not going to make any sense, but whenever I feed my cat, like when it's time for me to feed my cat dinner, uh, she likes to uh, meow in despair and sing the song of despair and screech. I think many cats do this when they realize the cat food can is being opened. And for some reason, uh, every time that I hear my cat doing this, I'm imagining... I, I could just hear Heidelin like hear the song of creations and because <laughs> that's what it's like my cat singing the song of despair every time uh, I feed her because it's like she's been starving and she's okay it doesn't matter interviewer certainly there's a lot for players to think about Ishikawa said for example is what Hermes did wrong or was it the first step for humanity is what Meteon did wrong or was it the people who gave Meteon her despair in the wrong? No. No. 
nobody was wrong. It was that was a beautiful thing about it because near the end of the story, you see so much suffering that Meteon has caused. And even at that final cutscene where you're walking, you're forced to walk, you don't like I didn't feel any ill will or hatred for Meteon. Like I still felt compassion for her, even though I was so upset about what was happening. Uh, which is very interesting, like a very interesting thing to do. Uh, it's a difficult thing to pull off for a villain. So, Oda said, I joined the project during 1.0, and there was already some fundamentals of the wor world building, such as the Ashians and Hydaelyn. In truth, we didn't know what to do with this lore. I'm glad that we were able to make them something players can understand. You did know what to do with the lore. You made it good. You made it way better. Yoshi P said, even back in Realm Reborn, Heavensward, and Stormblood, it was said, we don't have detailed lore yet for what the Ashians' goals are. So let's just have them do be doing bad stuff in the background. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait a minute. So you're telling me during Realm Reborn, Heavensward, and Stormblood, you said, let's just have those guys doing bad stuff in the background. <laughs> we'll figure it out. You didn't even know why. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Chicago said, it's easy to think we planned it out in advance, but in truth, that's wrong. The original Asian lore only went as far as, looks like they're doing bad stuff. <laughs> What? <laughs> Looks like they're doing bad stuff, man. Oh, man. You didn't have to say that. You really didn't have to tell on yourself like that, Yoshi P. <laughs> you could have said, well, this story has been in development since Final Fantasy 3. <laughs> and we've been plotting carefully this whole time. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. So, of course, we made some use of the lore. Of some lore we came up with earlier, too. Charlie and going to space is an example of that. That was already part of the lore? In 1.0, Charlian was established as, like, a field guide to the world. So even back then, there was a lore that they gather knowledge of the world in order to travel to other stars. Holy shit, that's crazy. Back in 1.0, it was said about the Ascians, they're paranormal entities that are planning something. They have no shadows. That's horrible. This is a horrible pitch for a bad guy. But back then, other characters' shadows also didn't display... <laughs> so the Ascian special feature was done away with. And so after that, they were rebuilt into a group of bad guys. The way the Scions have been depicted has changed a lot too. Uh, hold up. Ichikawa says that one idea behind the trust system introduced in Shadowbringers is that you can keep going on adventures with the Scions after the story is over. Yeah. Yoshida says that back during the development of Heavensward, Oda and the Realm Reborn slash Heavensward lead writer, Mehiro, told him that they strongly wanted to recreate the feeling in classic Final Fantasy games of going on a journey with party members. So they wrote the story of uh, Word of Light, Alfie, Estinian, and Isale's journey as the group of four. That was amazing. That was one of the strongest points of Heavensward, I think, when you are like traveling through the up the mountain and then you stop at the camp and like you're chatting. I, I really... That was a very strong memory for me. One of the first moments in my Final Fantasy XIV journey where I felt like super, super connected to all of the characters. About Graha, Ishikawa says that at the end of Crystal Tower, when Warrior of Light and Graha part ways, is implied that they will meet again. But at that point, it hadn't been decided at all when or how this would happen. I think that was pretty obvious to most of us. Like, 
it was pretty clear when he went back in the crystal tower like well he just put it they just put him in their pocket for use in a future expansion which is normal and fine what sort of discussions did you have with the design team for the zones Tavner is inspired by india what no way <laughs> garlemald is inspired by the roman empire and russia <sighs> We shared real world cultures and so on with the designers. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, interviewer said, by the way, at the end of Endwalker, Emmett hints at some new locations. But she said, this isn't the end of the story. So we wanted to create the feeling that the adventure continues as our next goal to work towards. Oh yeah. That did not hit well with me at all. This did not make me feel better at all. Um, I think it was supposed to make me feel better when he's talked about all the new locations you can go adventure in and travel to. But at the time, I was just like, no, I don't want to go anywhere else. Just stay with us. No, Emma, don't get me. Like, it was horrible. Like, I, <laughs> I was being a huge baby. Okay. Ishikawa said, from the planning stage, this was one of the lines I wanted to put in. Oda said, there's other continents we haven't visited yet. This time, we had to create a map for the entire world, since you can see the planet from the moon. Yeah, you can. You can see Maricidia, for example. Wow, this, inter this interviewer is on top of his shit. Are you kidding me? This interviewer is like, studied the planet from the moon already and noticed the continent of Maricidia there? Okay. That's right. This might be one finale, but I thought we had to leave the impression that the entire adventure isn't over while looking at Yoshida. I hear there's a guy who's thinking about the next 10 years. <laughs> Yoshifi said, there's also the shards. If you call it a multiverse, we can do anything. Oh no. <laughs> There's been, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Weren't there a lot of different copies of Meteon? And what if one of them slipped into the other, other universe? That's not a good idea. There's been opinions that we've been to space and fought despair. What could we possibly fight next? Yes. But in the Final Fantasy series, there's also been fights against nothingness. Did he just spoil the next expansion? <laughs> did he just... Did he just spoil? Bro. <laughs> Yoshi P. That said, it's just... Okay, whatever. That's it. I think it's wrong to think that because we fought despair this time. The next threat will be even bigger that the scale of the story will just keep increasing relentlessly. In the final scene, Xenos returned us to an adventure. I think maybe it'd be good to go on an adventure again. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's the correct path forward is not just make it more and more and more and more and more big and big and big and ridiculous. Like we need to reset ourselves and uh, humble ourselves so we can shift gears here, right? Go down a different path. So what was your favorite scene in Endwalker? Oda said the scene where you walk across the lifeless town in Ultima Thule. Oh, that was so creepy. Oh, that was so creepy. Ishikawa said, mine's the scene with Meteon in the flower field in Ultima Thule. Oh man, yeah. Everybody, look. <laughs> Flowers have no problem growing there because all of the tears of the players who have stood there. It's just like so many people crying that the ground is completely <laughs> soggy. It's like constantly getting watered by every new player who gets to that point. So they are never gonna, uh, they're never gonna wither. They're never gonna die. The next threat will be even bigger. That this. Oh wait, no, no, I'm looking at the wrong point. I'm completely off track. I'm completely off track because I highlighted it and I lost. I lost where I was. Okay, Yoshi P said his favorite scene. I requested to Ishikawa-san, when Uriyaje returns home, please settle his feelings regarding Moonbrita. 
Yes, that was really, really needed to be done. That was very appropriate. It was depicted in a beautiful way. I cried so many times while checking that scene. Oh, poor Yoshi B. Imagine that he has to check the scenes over and over and over. Ishikawa said Yoshi P is weak to that scene and the scene where Julius holds out his cup. Oh, yeah. I can't help, said Yoshi P. No matter how many times I watch it, my tear glance. <laughs> His tear glands. Can you work out your tear glands and have like buff tear glands? <laughs> but I was put in charge of F14's 1.0. Uriel J was the first original character we created, so I'm glad we could bring him this far. He's turned into an eccentric, competent astrologer. I think he's a good combo with Thancred. Yeah, definitely. Yoshi just said, another scene that left a strong impression is Tataru's welcome back with open arms after Ragnarok returns to Atheris. Shadowbringers was a story... Oh, man. <sighs> when you get back to the Rising Stones and you're asked, like, well, did you have a good adventure? Like, was it worthwhile? Was it there or was it Heidelin who asked you that? Who was it that asked you that? It was like, I think it was in the Rising Stones. Yeah, Shadowbringers was a story from good night to good morning. And N. Walker is a story from see you later to welcome back. Oh my god, I'm going to cry reading this interview. It's too much. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> this is stirring up too many emotions. Oh shit. It's Thancred. Yeah, when Thancred asked if you were happy to be a scion. Okay, anyway. This is, this is too much for me. Interview said, Hermes and Meteon are characters that have had different responses among players. Ishikawa said, when I was writing Hermes, I thought he'd be a character 80% of people would hate and 20% of people would love. I think it's reverse. Probably about 80% of people love Hermes. But even for the people who love him, you recognize his complexities and emptiness. But personally, I really, really love him. Me too. He himself made a huge mistake, but that mistake made him the foundation for everything that came after. Without Hermes, the story itself wouldn't have happened. Without him, the world might have become like what we saw in the third area of the Dead Ends dungeon. It would have definitely been that. It would have. De I think it was very obvious because you're in there and you see. Uh oh, crap. You see the people there wearing the robes. It's very similar to the Amoratine robes. And I think it's meant to be very much on the nose. It's meant to be very similar to... Because uh, they're also very uh, tall. I think they're quite quite big. Just be reminiscent of that. Okay, I have to wait a second. Where Rala appears. Hermes' mistake... It's like the first wound the people of Atheris bear. Whether people think this was a mistake or part of becoming stronger will differ. It had to happen. This is so in line with the message of Anne Walker, what she said here. Hermes' mistake is the first wound the people of Atheris bear. The wound that allowed Atheris to survive when all other worlds could not Without the wound, without the pain, without, with, like, it had everything just been normal and gone fine, Etheris would have been just another victim. Yeah, he passed the great filter. Interviewer said, what did you focus on while making the Elpisone? We kept in mind the concept of paradise. Oh, we'd made an area like the Sea of Clouds before. We wanted Elpis to look more man-made. It's similar to Amrat. But while Amrat felt lonely, Elpis feels warm. Yeah. She just said, we decided that Elpis should be the most beautiful area in the game. A world that's extremely beautiful, abundant, and on the surface, overflowing with happiness. But once you step in, we wanted it to feel dangerous. Dangerous. 
Back in Shadowbringers, we were afraid of the ancients, but an inwalker with the presence of those two we're familiar with, Emmett and Hithlo, they feel friendlier. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's pre-sundering, so. Yoshida, Yoshida said, when Harmi says he will make judgment on humanity, in a way, it's very impartial. Making judgment. This is something Emmett Selk did many times, and each time killed so many people. Emmett Selk wanted to get back his sundered friends and the people he loved, and with forthright emotions, he handed down his final judgment. Looking at it that way, Hermes made judgment in an objective way. So it's a bit surprising that we can forgive Emmett Selk's judgment, but we can't forgive Hermes. I, I think that... Mm. Hermes' judgment was honestly more reasonable than Emmett Selk's because he posed this question that looms over you through the rest of the story, which is, you know, why should mankind survive? Ishikawa said Hermes is impartial, but our hearts can't get close to him in the way we can with him itself. It's just because there wasn't enough time, I think, between our player character with Hermes. Though I I latched onto Hermes really hard pretty much immediately. I related to Hermes very, very much. So I had no problem sympathizing with probably because I'm vegan. And I felt like a lot of the things that he was saying about feeling the compassion for the animals that are just slaughtered because they've outlived their purpose. And that was, he felt like, <clears throat> he felt like a weirdo for being so upset about that. And he felt like maybe he's the aberration for being so upset about that. Like I, I just got I felt a lot of sympathy for him in that. And so maybe that's why just me personally, uh, I, I latched onto this character very easily. Yoshipi said, right, with Emmett Selk, it was easy to put your feelings into his own. Wanting to get your friends back is a very straightforward human emotion. Yoshipi says that Hermes is a character that is a bit like social media. Wait, what? <laughs> Although it would have been best to decide the answer on his own, he can't reach a decision himself and ends up listening to many different opinions. It would have been best for him to decide the answer on his own. Then in the final messages at the end of the interview. This is a very strange thing to say, <laughs> Yoshifi. Hermes is a character that's like social media. Is, is Meteon actually Twitter? I feel like, kinda, yeah. Social commentary. Tweety on. Hmm. I relate to that a lot because, especially lately, I have to consciously and deliberately limit the amount of time that I spend on Twitter because otherwise I will actually fall into a pit of despair because on Twitter you're just constantly hearing the feedback all the other tweets of all the despair and suffering that's going on in the world and it can sort of overwhelm you if you do not ground yourself but Meteon lacked the ability to ground herself she could not do that she could only fully immerse in the emotions of others. So in a way, when you use Twitter, you are like one of Meteon's sisters by engaging so much with the emotions of other people, the raw emotions that are just constantly, constantly, constantly coming without any end. Uh, so I, I definitely see that. That makes a lot of sense to me. There's another side to it too like <clears throat> it's not all negative but most of it probably is <laughs> yeah I'd say most of it is <clears throat> so
So, Ishikawa said, from now on, there will be a new storyline. But there are plans to release a supplemental story for Inwa. Oh, 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 really? Japanese fans suggest that she might be talking about stories in the Tales From side story series. Oh, I mean, that's fine. That would be okay. Actually, Ishikawa, how about... Well, maybe not you, because you might be busy working on the next expansion, but uh, maybe some novels... <laughs> maybe we could get, maybe we could get some uh, novel series of books about Final Fantasy lore. That would be awesome. Novels, please. <clears throat> like I would love some novels from the um, pre-sundering period. That would be pretty interesting. Or really, any time. I'm surprised we don't have that yet, but we do have this uh, short story. It's the Tales from Short Stories, so uh, I'm really going to be looking forward to that. I assume that's what they're talking about. I seriously doubt that this is a reference to, like, big side story quests being added. I, I doubt that, but who knows? I, I just doubt it. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, to clarify, I would not want... I don't think that this is something that you would have to worry about when it comes to Final Fantasy XIV writers. Obviously, I wouldn't want there to be novels that would serve as a substitute or like a serve as necessary reading to understand the plot. I think it would have to be novels that focus on maybe other characters that we don't necessarily meet in the main story quest. Just like other things going on outside of the purview of the Warrior of Light's perspective so that way it can flesh out the world a little more and just teach you more about the world and what's going on outside of our our own experience as the Warrior of Light or adventure. So this was really amazing. Uh, I'm glad that somebody translated the whole interview 